Yes, so let's just recall what was going on last time. So we were dealing with unpunctured surfaces. And we were defining a set of elements from the surface, which was B circ. And we were getting elements for each collection of non-intersecting arcs and closed curves on our surface. Okay. And so, to be more precise, what is this guy? It's just the product of all the arcs and closed curves in this collection C. We didn't technically define what this, uh, what this element is when it's a closed curve, but we will see that today shortly. And what we wanted to do was show that B circ is a basis for the cluster algebra with principal coefficients. over the coefficient ring. Okay. And we managed to show that this set B circ spans the corresponding cluster algebra. And we were on our way to showing that this set is also linearly independent. And the backbone to that argument was all, all based on this proposition, right? Uh, we were able to choose some n by n extended exchange matrix with linear independent columns by choosing principal coefficients. And the thing that we were working towards was to show that every element in this set can be written in this form. And once we've done that, then we need to show that the kind of leading term is unique amongst all of these. So for each element in the basis, the leading term is unique in some sense. Okay. And so to recap a little bit more, we were going down the route of writing this expansion in terms of snake graphs. So, of course, we always fix a triangulation T, which is corresponding to our initial cluster. And we weren't considering closed curves yet, we were considering arcs. So let alpha be an oriented arc. Not in our initial triangulation. So our picture was looking something like this. This white line is our oriented arc alpha, and it was intersecting arcs in our triangulation, and we were using the notation by denoting the intersection points by P1, P2, respecting the order in which we intersect. And we'll adopt the convention of labeling the arc that has this intersection P1 by gamma I2. P2 is gamma I4. And the one containing PD is gamma I2D. And in the cluster algebra with principal coefficients, we noticed we had the following expansion. So 
So it was written as 1 over the crossing monomial. And then we were summing over all perfect matchings of the snake graph. PM stands for perfect matching. Okay, and let's just recall what this terminology is. So the crossing monomial of, oops, I'm writing, meant to write alpha here. The crossing monomial of alpha with respect to T was defined over the product over all arcs intersecting alpha, including multiplicity. Okay, XP was defined to be the product over all edges in our perfect matching. Remember, the edges in the snake graph correspond to arcs, so this makes sense. And YP was to be was defined as the product over all alpha oriented arcs okay so this is the story when we have an arc, but we want to now understand what these variables are when we have a, a closed curve. So this is where band graphs come in, which is essentially a snake graph which has been glued onto itself. So now, let alpha be a closed curve and an oriented one. So our picture is looking something like this. Again, this arc intersects our triangulation somehow, and we'll label the, the vertices, I mean the, the intersection points from P1 to PD, if there are D intersections. And so what graph are we going to associate to this? Well, we decide to start, say here, and end here. And so from this point to this point, we just define the usual snake graph. So this idea of having a tile for each quadrilateral uh, containing the intersection points, and we alternate between the quadrilateral being on the surface and then the mirror image of the quadrilateral on our surface. So right, if we travel along this bit, we can just spit out a snake graph. So the first tile we know contains P1, and the last tile will contain PD. But this is a closed curve, right? And so really, we should be finishing this procedure by going from PD back to P1. And this will, if we do this and we follow this procedure, then it will give us a way to glue this tile to this first tile. Right. So this is, at the moment, just a snake graph, or 
a snake graph. And so if we were to carry on this procedure, we would get a tile here, or we might get a tile here, right? And then this would be having P1 here, or P1 here. And of course, we ne then need to identify this tile back to here, and it gives us a gluing on either this edge, if the tile was here, or this edge, if the tile was there. Okay. So there are four possibilities, depending on whether the tile is here or here, and depending on whether D is even or, or D is odd. Because remember, we have maybe this agrees with, your, with the, the orientation of the surface, in which case the quadrilateral we see here is exactly the quadrilateral we see here. And if D is odd, and this is an even tile, and then this will kind of be the mirror image of this tile, and we would get a, a different gluing. So we can just run through the four scenarios. So we can draw them now. Okay. So let's suppose if we do the construction on the next tile, the tile appears at the top here. So this is P1. This is PD, this is P1. And likewise, let's suppose P1 appears here. And in this case, we're supposing D is even. And in this case, we're supposing D is odd. OK, okay. and we know we therefore need to be gluing this tile, this edge to this tile somehow, and likewise this edge to this tile somehow. Right. So if D is, is even, like I've said, this tile is precisely this tile. And so if we label this vertex 1 and this one 2, then of course we would be gluing in this way. But if D is odd, this is kind of the mirror image. So again, if this vertex is 1 and this one's 2, then in this case you can see we would be gluing in this way. Right, and then we can do the last situation, which is the case when the extra tile was not coming here, but it was coming here. And again, this case splits into even and odd, D. Right, and now we would be gluing this edge to the first tile in some sense, in some way. Okay, and the gluings, as you can see, would be in this way. Where here, again, D is even, and here. D is odd, and this glued snake graph is called uh, the band graph associated to this 
closed curve alpha. which we again denote S alpha of T. Okay, so it's clear that we want something like uh, this again. Uh, and I mean, we could define it in that way, but it, it, it would be the wrong way to define it because, like I said, there is uh, some motivation behind how we're going to define these variables, which is in, in terms of lambda lengths. Uh, and to match it up with this, we don't want to just consider perfect matchings of these graphs, but we want to consider a certain subset of those perfect matchings. So definition for alpha closed curve. We say a good perfect matching of the associated band graph is a perfect matching such that after cutting along this glued red, glued red edge, which is a perfect matching, which extends to a perfect matching after cutting along the red edge. Okay. Right, so what do I mean by that is probably most helpful to understand in terms of an example. So we'll look at an example which is a good perfect matching and which is not a good perfect matching. Yeah. Yeah. You're saying explain how we get those uh, identifications on the edges? Mm -hmm. So we've just kind of written the snake graph using this part of the curve, just in the usual way. And then we've done it one extra time. So we've applied it to P1 again to get another tile up here. And then we've, we know that this must be exactly looking like this. And so we need to glue this to this. And when we do it, we get a gluing on this edge. And so we realize how we're going to glue this snake graph to itself. Is that clear? Okay. Right, OK. so. Let's look at this, uh, this identified snake graph, so a band graph. So we've glued along the red edges. And if we were to look at this matching, this is a perfect matching of this band graph, right? Because you might not think that this vertex is hit, but it is hit. It's hit by this. Okay. Here is one, and here is two, and here is one, and here is two. So this edge, I mean, this vertex is covered. And this, so is this vertex. It's also covered. But when we cut along the red arc, we are left 
with this matching, and this cannot be extended into a perfect matching, right? Because we need to cover this vertex and this vertex, and well, there's no edge between them. So this is not a good perfect matching. So what is, well, perhaps something that looks like this, because when we cut, we're left with this matching, and this can be extended into a perfect matching, because we can add this edge here. Okay, so this is an example of a good, perfect matching. Okay, and from now on, just so I don't have to write kind of everything twice, we'll refer to a perfect matching of a snake graph also has a good perfect matching. So, uh, suppose notation, or terminology maybe. Uh, uh, so, we now call a perfect matching of a snake graph also a good perfect matching. Right. And the whole reason, well, okay, so before I say anything, uh, we should go back to okay, okay. Yes? What do I mean by cut? Uh, so it, I'm just referring to uh, we've glued the snake graph together, and we've cut it along this edge. Actually, I mean, for simplicity, I've said just cut along the red arc, but actually this would make sense if you cut along anywhere in the, in the, in the snake graph, to like cut it into kind of... Uh, now, if you cut a band graph into a snake graph, then, then, then you could cut anywhere. But for simplicity, I'm, uh, I'm just saying cut along the red, the, the red one. The way that we had a snake graph and then we glued it into the band graph. Is that clear? If you cut... Uh, so, we've... Mm-hmm. How do you get the, but, oh, what I've said is, so we've just cut it and we've had a matching. It's not, it's not, it's just a matching of edges. And then we're asking whether we can extend that into a, a perfect matching, yes? Okay. But it does not depend on the choice, uh, choice of the red edge. So, um, wh whether it has a perfect matching, uh, whether it has a good perfect matching, Yes, I, I mean, I don't know what easy, but yes, I think uh, it is fairly simple. So essentially what would go wrong is if, uh, okay, what goes wrong is if you have a matching like this, and if you are trapped, if you have something like that, then you're kind of trapped from then onwards, and there's only just one way you can do it, and so we're just saying no to this, and so... Yes, I, th uh, I mean, is it clear that... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, and yeah, what... Well... Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, I mean, yes, yeah, so I would say it's obvious that it's independent of where you started. Just because, I mean, you're just continuing everything uh, in the same way, right? I mean, you've got to the, you've got to the end, and, 
and you've glued in it and it wouldn't have mattered where you, where you started. Where you cut it, then I can understand that maybe it's not obvious that when you cut it, the, the, the notion of good perfect matching is independent of where you cut. But, but the, re, the way I was trying to explain this was, was here, and the only way you get a bad perfect matching is some, in, in some way is if you have a scenario like this. Yeah. Exactly, yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah, I mean, once you have a... Uh, I mean, in a snake graph, you could never, ever match anything like, like this, right? Because you would go on, and then you would end up having a vertex that is not covered. And so that's the reason why this notion of good perfect matching is independent of choice, choice of cut, right? Okay. Okay. But yes, where was I? Yeah, I seem to have erased the bit that I didn't actually want to erase, but um, we got to this point. We have a notion of good perfect matching, and now we have... Uh, we can spit out the same kind of expansion formula, right? So, uh, we define the following. Where P is a good perfect matching of the associated snake graph or band graph xp yp remain the same okay right so I, we know that uh, for arcs this is exactly the cluster variable and for closed curves we're just artificially defining it in this way Right. So the whole point of us going down the route of snake graphs is because it makes it very easy to understand how uh, different uh, terms are related in this expansion. And we do this by explaining or understanding what happens in certain local moves called twists on the perfect matchings or the good perfect matchings. So moving between good perfect matchings is our next route. And there are going to be two very special uh, good perfect matchings which come from the following observation. So a snake or band graph has exactly two good perfect matchings with the property So good perfect matchings that contain only boundary arcs of the associated snake or band graph. Okay. And from this observation, we'll define two. Uh, good perfect matchings. So to do that, let's just label the first tile. So in our first tile, this west edge we'll say is E2, and the south edge is E1. And so, the minimal
matching P minus is the one containing P one. The maximal matching P plus is the one containing P two. Okay, so an example. So let's take the following good perfect, perfect matching of these snake graphs. And so these in, in this case this is the this is the minimal and this is the maximal, and let's just kind of look at a property so we can we take these uh, good perfect matchings and we can look at their associated complete T path by filling in the diagonals. Okay. And we remembered that in the odd tiles, when a diagonal is going up, it means uh, the, uh, the corresponding arc is not alpha orientated. And when it's going down, it is al alpha orientated. And in the even ones, it's the reverse of that. And so here, we see in the minimal matching, we get no coefficients. And in the maximal, we get the maximal amount of coefficients. So here, we have no. Alpha oriented arcs and all alpha oriented arcs. So all all diagonals are alpha oriented arcs here. Uh, here there are no al alpha oriented arcs. Here all of them are. Okay. So with this class of good perfect matchings, we're now going to talk about moving between perfect matchings. And a twist of a good perfect matching is the following local move. Okay, so here we've matched these vertices, but of course, another matching would have been in this way, and of course, doing this would still mean the rest of the 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 edges are are matched, and so this is a, a move between perfect matchings. And in particular, move between good perfect matchings. Oh. 
Okay. And what we're going to consider is a, match, uh, uh, a twist which moves from uh, a kind of a diagonal which is not alpha-oriented to one that is alpha-oriented. So consider a twist of a good perfect matching P to another good perfect matching P prime. Where, as I said, the diagonal of the corresponding tile changes from not alpha oriented to alpha oriented. And such a twist is called positive. Okay, so let's study this move more closely. Right, and suppose that this first tile is an odd tile. Odd meaning that it agrees with the orientation of our surface. Okay. And so, if this thing is a positive move, so it's going in this direction, from this tile to this tile, then a positive twist would be the following. Okay. And let's label the edges, gamma ij, gamma ik, gamma il, and gamma im, and then this a uh, diagonal will label gamma i e. Okay. And we want to study how the corresponding expansion term changes under this positive under this uh, positive twist. So we'll look at the quantity x p prime prime y p prime, and how does it differ to x p y p? So here is p, and here is p prime. Okay. Well, in p prime, now we have the variable associated to gamma i j and gamma i l. Okay. But what we're missing here is gamma ik and gamma im. Okay. And because this is a positive twist, we hadn't got this variable in p, but we do have it in p prime. Right? So we have now the coefficient y gamma i.e., and of course, this is the only difference, and so we have this relationship. And okay, so thinking back to this picture over here, we wanted a leading term, and we wanted the exponent of any other term to differ by uh, some, po some positive sum of, uh, of the columns in our exchange matrix, so let's just 
recall what our exchange matrix, extended exchange matrix looks like. Okay. So let's just draw the quiver in this case. So this tile agrees with the orientation on our, of our surface. Oops. Yeah, this is this is correct. And so we will have our quiver looking like this. And so in the column IE of B tilde, we have the following. So the IJs and ILs entry is one. Right, these are going into IE. And the IKs and IMs entry is minus one because these are going out. And then finally, we can't forget the coefficients. We had principal coefficients, and so we will have an entry in the. I mean, we will have a. Uh, we will have a one in the entry IE uh, plus n. So in the I E in the I E plus N entry is one, and then we have zero everywhere else, of course. Okay. And so, okay, yeah, just to clarify, we have a, a one in this entry because we took principal coefficients. Okay. So we can summarize how far we've got and kind of the information we just got from looking at this positive move by studying this behavior, if you think about it, this is exactly what we get from adding a column in our, well, adding the column IE to the exponent, right? The, the, the IE uh, column of, of B tilde. The summary. If we have a positive twist between good perfect matchings P and P from P to P prime, we get in a kind of simpler form XP prime, Y P prime is equal to x p y p x of h where h is a column in our extended exchange matrix b tilde and then we're almost done in terms of putting it in this form right the kind of last thing in the puzzle is to realize that there exists a perfect matching such that for any other perfect matching, we can get to it in a sequence of positive twists. And that's exactly what Musica and Schiffler and Williams were able to do. So let P be a good perfect matching. 
of a snake or band graph. Then P is connected from the minimal matching by a sequence of positive twists. Okay. So this leading entry is going to correspond to our minimal matching. So let's just write another summary. By the proposition we just saw. For each arc or closed curve, Alpha then X of alpha in our proposed basis B circ is of the desired form in the sense that it can be written as X G plus some sum of other terms over columns in B tilde with the leading term coming from our minimal matching P minus. Right, so I mean this is quite a lot of elements in our basis but not all because we need to take all uh, kind of non-intersecting collections of arcs and, and, uh, and, and closed curves. But if we have this on the level of arcs and closed curves, just one of them, well, we could take a product. If we take products of anything of this form, we again get something of this form, right? And so in that sense, we're done. We have able, we're able to write every element in B-circ in this form. And now we have to check uh, uh, this, uh, this uniqueness property, right? Uniqueness of the leading term in some sense. Okay. So, right, let me s just write down what I just said. So, taking products of two such. Elements of that form gives, again, something in the desired form. Okay, so this implies that everything in B-circ Every element in B circ can be written in this way. Okay. And so to show linear independence, we just have to check this uniqueness property. is to prove the uniqueness of the leading terms. And 
going to do this, as I mentioned last time. We will use the notion of G vectors. So the first thing to notice is that for anything that can be written in this form, there is a notion of G vector. G vector being the thing that, uh, uh, I mean, has, uh, has been introduced already. You put the, the kind of standard ZN grading uh, on your cluster algebra, and the elements are homogeneous with respect to this grading. So uh, this, this, this spits out the notion of a G vector. So anything of the form XG plus the sum of columns in the extended exchange matrix is homogeneous. with respect to standard ZN grading that was introduced last week. Okay. So we have the notion of G vector. for each element in our basis. Or proposed basis. Okay. So this uniqueness is going to follow from the follow following theorem again of Masaka, Shiflin, Williams. Which says this G vector map which takes a element in B circ and spits out its G vector. is a bijection between the elements in B circ and, and Zn. And so as immediately as a and an immediate corollary we can then realize that we have this uniqueness property. So why? Well For each arc or closed curve, alpha, we can note the following, which is that the G vector is the degree of the leading term, because the leading term contains no coefficients because the minimal, as you remember, had no alpha-oriented arcs. So the G vector of the arc or closed curve is the degree of the leading term. And that's because Well, we don't see any y variable here because, well, it's, it's 1. OK. And so moreover, so this was on arcs and closed curves, but we want to know for collections of non-intersecting arcs and closed curves, 
and we get the following result. So for any such collection or their associated variable, How would we write the g-vector of this? Well, it would just be the sum of the g-vectors in which over the arcs, it can, arcs and closed curves it contains. Okay. And so what do we realize here? Well, the exponent of the leading term can be written explicitly in terms of this g vector. Which is obviously the g vector followed by n zeros. So the first n part of the vector is, is the g vector and the remaining n are, are zeros. And this is true for, for any element in our basis. And therefore the g vector will give us the uniqueness that we wanted. The g-vector bijection implies uniqueness of leading term. And then we've satisfied everything in this proposition, and so we've finally proven linear independence. We've proven linear independence of the elements of the elements in B circ. Okay. And so, how long is uh, is left? Fifteen minutes. Okay. Right. So up until this point, we've shown that this class of elements span the cluster algebra. We've shown that they're linearly independent. And the final thing is to prove that they actually belong to the cluster algebra. And once we've done that, then they're a basis. Then they would form a basis. OK. So the final part is part three, which is wanting to show that BSERC belongs to the corresponding cluster algebra. And of course, we only have to show this for arcs and one-sided closed curves. And for arcs, we of course know that they are in the arcs correspond to a, a cluster variable. And so therefore, obviously, they're in the, the cluster algebra. So really, what remains to show is that the, the corresponding variables of the closed curves belong to the cluster algebra. So to show this, it suffices to show x of alpha is in the cluster algebra for any closed curve alpha on our surface. OK. So how is this done? Well, Musica, Schiffler, and Williams did this for the following class of surface surfaces. So 
surfaces with, well, one class was with greater than two boundary components. And then another class of surface they were able to show it for was with one, well, greater a one boundary component and greater than two marked points. on each boundary. Well, okay, so if we had one boundary component, then they would need at least two marked points on them. Okay. But the argument also extends in the case which we would have more than one boundary component. Okay. And then Kanechi. Lee and Schiffler. We're able to prove it for the remaining surface. Which is, of course, the surface with one boundary component and one marked point. And one marked point. Okay. And for these two things, it was proved using the Skeen relations. And we'll just go run through A and then maybe you can attempt to be yourself. And for C, the key part was showing that the closed curve around the boundary component is in the cluster algebra. And then from there, they were able to prove it using the skin relations. So I should say, after showing uh, uh, the uh, closed curve, around the boundary component, they also used skin relations. Okay, so let's just run through A to give you an idea of how this is achieved. So here's a bit of boundary, and we're assuming at least two marked points around the boundary. And although we draw three here, just think that perhaps we can take these uh, marked points and join them at the back, so it is just two marked points. Okay. So we have some closed closed curve in our surface. So there's a bunch of stuff here. It can't collapse. It's a closed curve. And we would like to be able to say that the, uh, the element corresponding to this, uh, this closed curve is in the cluster algebra. OK. So we consider a bunch of curves in which we can apply the scheme relation, which will pop out this uh, closed curve 
and then just do some basic algebra. So, we consider this collection of curves. And we resolve the crossings. So we can apply the scheme relation on this to get the following picture. Well, more precisely, we're going to apply the smoothing. Okay, so smooth it like this. Right, so we'd get something like this is our, when we smooth it this way, and then we need to smooth it the other way. So plus this picture. Sorry? Ah, sure. Okay, so wait, have I... We did this one and then this one. So we did this and this. And where is the second intersection point? Have I not resolved this correctly? So we do this, and then it comes back, yes. But the thing is, we've just homotoped this down to here, right? I've done this correctly, right? Yes, OK. Yeah, sure, OK, OK, OK. So the intermediate step would have been, uh, right, it would have been like, this down here, and we would have been going like this, right? And then we've just, well, used homotopy to, 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 to get rid of those uh, intersection that we didn't need. Okay. Okay. Right. Mm -hmm. What are, oh, so the red region was just uh, kind of some, it's not in the collection of curves, it's just some guide in terms of a curve that we want to obtain, right, using the scheme relations. We want to be able to show that, uh, that every uh, element corresponding to a closed curve is in our cluster algebra, and we're going to obtain that uh, element by using the scheme relations on on these white arcs, right? So the red arc is not part of our collection, it's just there is a guide to one that we want to obtain. Is that clear? Okay. Right, okay, so, oops. So we have this bunch of arcs here, and now we just need to resolve this intersection here. Okay, and so what, it, what does this one split into? It splits into... Okay. So here's our boundary segment. Okay, if we smooth this way, we get this guy, which is exactly the thing that we wanted to get. Okay, let's 
just draw the plus on the top here. If we smoothed the other way, then we would get this guy. Okay. And so we have this now uh, equation. I mean, you can imagine, well, I've only drawn the smoothings here, but you can imagine you can uh, write the corresponding skein relations. So now let me just delete this red arc to make everything clear. So we know that this belongs to our cluster algebra. We know that this does. And we know that this does. And so therefore, we know that this quantity here belongs to the cluster algebra. And seeing as these are coefficients, we can divide by them. And then therefore, this, it, it would apply that this thing is in the cluster algebra and is exactly what we wanted to, wanted to show. So, okay, so it implies that this is in our cluster algebra. And, okay, let me just draw this as the red arc. This is the closed curve that we wanted to obtain. Okay. And one can do a very similar thing for, for, for B. For C, like I said, it's slightly more complicated. But once you assume that you have the closed curve around the boundary, you can still play this game of skiing relations and, and realize it in the same way. Sorry. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. This is this is a yeah. This is a result of smoothing that it's uh, whatever you get is independent on 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 the choices of intersections that you smooth on. Yes. Uh, what is what now? Oh, okay. So this was our first step. Uh, and then this was our second step. And, okay, I cheated a little bit because this I should be writing up here, and then this would be our third step, right? Where, okay, let's just define this by one, then one should also be in, in this class. Okay. Okay. Sure. Yeah, I'm done. Yeah, okay, sure. <laughs>